Welcome to A Century of Cinema. Today I will be exploring my favourite films of 1962. First up, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, directed by Robert Aldrich, stars Betty Davis and Joan Crawford as sisters Jane and Blanche Hudson. As a child, Jane was a darling of the stage, but fortune switched in young adulthood when Blanche became a movie star, until she became a paraplegic due to some shenanigans with a car and a gate. Later, the two ageing sisters live together where Blanche is dependent on an increasingly vicious Jane, who is trying to prevent Blanche from selling their house while making a tragic attempt to resurrect her career with the help of her accompanist Edwin, Victor Buono, on debut. Whatever Happened to Baby Jane is quite a tense thriller, which is also rich with dark humour, thanks to Lucas Heller's script, based on Henry Farrell's novel, and further enhanced by the performances. Victor Bueno makes a unique impression in his debut film role, admirably holding his own with the two stars. Joan Crawford gives probably her best performance as Blanche, very restrained and internal. But it is Betty Davis who steals the show as Jane, calling on every dark and insane arrow in her quiver to deliver a powerhouse performance, eating up every scene. Whether she's screaming at her sister or wistfully recalling the good old days, she is owning the screen. I don't want to talk about it! Every time I think about something nice, you, you remind me of all the bad things. I only want to talk about the nice things. Remember when Daddy and I used to rehearse at the beach? Betty received her 10th and final Oscar nomination for Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, and she is my choice for Best Actress for the ninth time. To Kill a Mockingbird, based on the novel by Harper Lee and adapted by Horton Foote, stars Gregory Peck as lawyer Atticus Finch, who is appointed to defend Tom Robinson, Brock Peters, a black man accused of raping a white woman in the South in the 1930s. Yeah, this is an uphill battle to say the least. The story is told from the perspective of Atticus's daughter Scout, Scout, played by Mary Badham. Much of the film is dedicated not necessarily to the trial, but the general goings-on in the town, as experienced by Scout and her older brother Jem. This is quite simply a classic film based on a beloved novel, ably directed by Robert Mulligan, with excellent performances all around. The kids, Mary Badham and Philip Alford, tasked with carrying a significant portion of the movie, do an excellent job, and unlike some other child actors, lack any trace of actor precociousness. Brock Peters' supporting turn as the accused Tom Robinson is so heart-wrenching and demonstrates a genuine talent for his craft. Robert Duvall's brief and silent appearance as Boo Radley, his film debut, has an incredible level of impact for such a small role, hauntingly beautiful. And Gregory Peck is, as always, excellent. Peck would win an Oscar for playing Atticus against some very stiff competition. 1962 had some truly stellar performances. And according to some who knew him, he was essentially playing himself in To Kill a Mockingbird. However, I believe it is Horton Foote's adaptation of Harper Lee's novel which shines the brightest. It can be difficult to write an adult's film from a child's perspective, as it would be for a novel. So Foote had some excellent groundwork already laid, but he manages to keep the authenticity and innocence of childhood intact, while also telling a compelling, nuanced, grown-up story. This is most apparent in the magnificent trial scenes, emotionally fraught, yet logically sound. It is an excellent piece of work, so it is my choice of best screenplay of 1962. Blake Edwards' Days of Wine and Roses written by J.P. Miller, based on his teleplay. Stars Jack Lemmon and Lee Remick as Joe and Kirsten, a loving couple who spiral into alcoholism, decide to quit together, relapse together, and when Joe joins AA and begins to truly recover, Kirsten does not quit and slips away from him, even causing Joe at some point, who was doing very well, to relapse again, just so he could be with her, before getting back on the wagon for good. Days of Wine and Roses is a beautifully written and directed film. I think it's Blake Edwards' best work. But it is the remarkable performances of Lee Remick and Jack Lemmon at their absolute best.
best, which stand out the most. And while, Remet, uh, while Lee Remick does an incredible job as Kirsten, convincingly on a gradual decline from sweet-natured teetotaler to slutty bar skank, it is Jack Lemon bringing every ounce of his comedic and dramatic talents to bear to play Joe. In the beginning, he is the standard, funny, goofy Jack Lemon we're all accustomed to, but drunk. And then he becomes volatile and agonised and broken. It is actually quite difficult to watch him at times because he is just that authentic. But watch you should, because he is giving a masterclass. And in a year brimming with brilliant performances, Jack Lemon is my choice for best actor. I saw myself, my reflection in the window. And I thought, I wonder who that bum is. And then I saw it was me. David Lean's Lawrence of Arabia, based on the life of British soldier T.E. Lawrence, stars Peter O'Toole as Lawrence, who, to his delight, is sent into the desert during World War I to find Prince Faisal, Alec Guinness, for some military political stuff I don't really give a crap about, and ends up leading various tribes of Arabs to take Damascus from the Turks. His companion through most of this time is Sharif Ali, played by Omar Sharif, who is a kind of sidekick, sounding board, and sometimes conscience. There's quite a bit of plot to deal with. It is almost four hours long. And it is a good story, but that's not why it's here. It's here because it is David Lean's magnum opus. It is one of the most stunningly executed films I've ever seen. Gargantuan in scale, yet intimate in tone. It has a star-studded cast, including Anthony Quinn as Alda, Claude Rains as Dryden, and most memorably, Jose Ferrer as a creepy as hell, very rapey Turkish general in the most disturbing scene in the film. Alec Guinness makes some very interesting acting choices as Faisal, making him both charming and subtly off-putting. Omar Sharif brings tons of fire and passion to Ali, and Peter O'Toole gives the performance of his career as Lawrence. Another one of those magnificent performances of 1962. Such a great year for acting. His calmness and effete quirkiness belie a voracious ego and a raging torrent of bloodlust buried beneath, which creeps out more and more as the story progresses. And now we come to the truly magical aspects of the film, the cinematography and the score. Freddie Young won a practically necessary Oscar for his cinematography in Lawrence of Arabia. It is one of maybe a handful of films where you can realistically claim that it is the most beautiful looking film ever. This is one of them. And I would argue to that point in time, it has no real competition. I don't need to say anything. Just look at it. And while you're doing that, have a listen to Maurice Shah's timeless, also Oscar winning musical score. David Lean crafted a genuinely majestic piece of cinema here, pacing a four-hour movie so well that it feels like two, eliciting excellent, impassioned performances from his actors and doing it on the most epic scale. That's why he is my choice for Best Director of 1962. Finally, David and Lisa, directed by Frank Perry and written by his wife Eleanor Perry, based on Theodore Isaac Rubin's novella Lisa and David. Kia Dahlia plays David, who was sent to a school for the mentally ill. He has an extreme fear of being touched and is cold and abrasive to everyone. Until he meets Lisa, played by Janet Margolin in her film debut, who is referred to as schizophrenic and only speaks in rhyme. Lisa softens David's personality, and in turn, David centers Lisa. They quickly get very attached to each other and help each other heal and grow. I just love this film. It is so unique and emotionally resonant. Everything about it combines perfectly to make a bit of magic. Director Frank Perry seems to have been heavily influenced by the European films of the time. The look, tone, style, performances all evoke that otherness and ethereal quality which was prevalent in the French, Italian, Swedish films of the late 50s and early 60s. And the script is poetic in its simplicity 
and delicate romanticism. Kia Dahlia, most famous as another David in 2001 A Space Odyssey, with his cold, piercing stare and robotic movements, all of which is lightened in the presence of Lisa, is ideally cast, and even with the brilliant performances seen this year, still manages to distinguish himself, carving out a niche of his own. And Janet Margolin is nothing short of spellbinding as Lisa. When she smiles, you just feel warm all over, and it makes perfect sense that even the emotionally distant David can't help but love her. So when she breaks down, just as convincingly, it is all the more devastating. These two unique performances of these two beautiful characters are the main reasons why David and Lisa is my best picture of 1962. David, look at me. What do you see? What do you see? I see a girl who looks like a pearl. A pearl of a girl. Join me next time on A Century of Cinema when I will be discussing my favourite films of 1963. Now go watch a movie.